Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We have a great episode planned for you today, episode 81. We're going to talk about the recent cyber criminal gang called Lapsus. And these guys have been in the news and recently have come to surface because of all the high profile attacks that they've had lately. They are internationally based as far as we know. That's the information from the FBI and CISA. And their aim has been to solicit ransomware payments with the intent of leaking stolen information if those payments aren't met. And while it is a tactic that we have seen ransomware gangs use where they've encrypted data and then requested a ransomware payment for the decryption key, and then if that hasn't been met, they release the information, Lapsus hasn't been using ransomware to gain any type of access to the stolen information they have used other methods which we'll go into but the data that they're stealing is not encrypted they just steal the data using various access and then threaten to release it and if they don't get the payments they they do actually release the data so unlike other ransomware and cyber criminal gangs they distinguish themselves with a little bit of originality and they don't use any of the classic communication channels like the dark websites or Tor or anything like that. They actually have two Telegram channels, which if you're not familiar with Telegram, we've talked about it in the past as a messaging app similar to Signal or WhatsApp or something like that. But Telegram is actually a little bit more towards like a social media type app where you can have a channel and then have followers similar to like a YouTube channel or a TikTok channel. And so they have two Telegram channels where they've accumulated almost 33,000 subscribers. What they do in their Telegram channel is they send out solicitation to get recruited to their efforts to try to breach companies. They openly announced that they're looking for moles in various companies like Microsoft, Apple, EA, AT&T. And this isn't surprising because one of their methods is to use internal employees in order to gain access. And when I was doing my research for this, they posted one of the screenshots and I'll just kind of read through what they posted in their Telegram channel. It says, we're recruiting employees slash insiders at the following. Any companies providing telecommunications, Claro, Telefo- Telefonica, at and and others similar. Large software gaming corporations, Microsoft, Apple, EA, IBM, and others similar. Call centers slash BPMs. Teleperformance and other similar server hosts. OVH, local web, and other similar. To note, we are not looking for data. We are looking for employees to provide us a VPN or Citrix to the network or some AnyDesk. So very open about what they are looking for. And obviously, they're willing to compensate folks for this. This is the first part, and we'll get into more of this as we unpack here, on why Lapsus is so challenging and important to defend against is because they're turning a lot of traditional tactics on their ear. And we have referenced so many times in the show, at least I have that famous XKCD comic that people trot out whenever they talk about stuff like this, about how technology folks dream of attackers trying to break into their laptop and discovering it's 4096 bit RSA encrypted and saying, blast, we're foiled again. And in reality, they would say, here's a $5 wrench, hit them until they tell us the password, drug them until they tell us the password. And that's like this. 
like we have people who build all these intrusion detection platforms and intrusion prevention systems and firewalls and uh, everything else that goes with that, you know, thinking about protecting the outer perimeter of it, but they're not looking for people who walk through the front gate with valid ID, right? And that's what this is. It's insider risk. And insider risk is something we've been talking about more and more in our day jobs, Andy, for sure, because that is exactly what this threat represents is it's an insider, an identity, an account, a device you may trust. And now you have to be able to find that anomalous behavior and shut that down. And so this is, this is a new challenge that generally defenders have not really geared themselves towards detecting and preventing in the past. And that's why lapsus probably has been so successful to be honest is because they are finding or have found that weakest link in the security architecture, which is detecting valid credentials and identities that are doing invalid uh, activities, you know, anomalous activities. So we'll go through this more as we go along, but this is just an example of the ingenuity of the lapsus group. They're not doing anything crazy from a technology perspective. They're not doing like super clever zero day attacks, you know, breaking into, um, devices and like soldering, you know, leads to, to pull the TPM, um, key, you know, the keys for BitLocker off the TPM or anything goofy like that. They're walking through the front door. And this is where we get so hung up on all these like theoretical attacks that could happen when in reality we have proof of how these attack groups work. And, um, we'll, we'll talk through that more as we go along. So we're going to go through some of the campaigns that they've had lately. And like we mentioned, relatively speaking, they've been fairly off the radar for a very, very long time. They're not new. They've been around and anyone who's in the threat intelligence community for cybersecurity have known about them, but they've come into the media because of some of the high profile customers that they've recently revealed and honestly bragged about. They, they haven't really tried to stay off the radar, they've openly said, hey, these are the companies that we have attacked. And some of them include Vodafone, LG, Ubisoft, NVIDIA, Samsung, Microsoft, and Okta most recently. So we're going to dive into just a few of these attacks. NVIDIA was one of the first high profile ones of late. And that attack happened on February 23rd of this year. They stole approximately one terabyte worth of data concerning the projects of the company and or its customers. And most notably, it also stole certificates allowing NVIDIA to sign their binaries. Now, this was very concerning for cybersecurity professionals because the code signing certificate allows the NVIDIA developers to digitally sign their executables, including their drivers, so that Windows and end users can verify the file's ownership and whether it has been tampered by a third party. And also to increase security in Windows, Microsoft requires kernel mode drivers to be code signed before the operating system will even load them. Now, if you're not familiar with how certs work and drivers and and code signing, when I was researching this, I learned a little bit. So we're going to talk about these certificates. Now, the ones that they stole were actually expired. And you might be thinking, well, if they're expired, then they're no good. Now, a compromise cert can only be revoked by its CA or certificate authority. That's different than expiring. So revocation means that you're actually taking it away and putting it on a list to not allow it to be used, whereas expired just means that the date that it's valid until has gone past. So every certificate authority or CA maintains this certificate revocation list or CRL. And in order for a certificate to be revoked, it has to be revoked prior to the expiration date. That's really important. Once the certificate has been revoked, then the system will no longer trust it. But if it isn't revoked prior to the expiration date, the system will continue to trust the cert. 
Now, Microsoft has always made an exception for signed drivers because if a certificate expires, you don't want to just take that away because it may brick a system. Like think about drivers that are being utilized in your operating system. And if they were to expire and someone made a mistake and didn't renew that certificate, then something in your system may just ultimately break. And so Microsoft has always made an exception for expired certs, not revoked certificates in order for the operating system to not load that certificate, it would have to be on a CRL. So that's very important to know. How do you protect against, you know, something that is expired and criminals could use to sign malware with these valid certificates, even though they're expired, they're going to continue to load. One thing is that there's nothing to prevent malware engines from detecting these certificates because we know what the cert serial numbers are. Defender has already loaded them into an untrusted certificate list. So if Microsoft Defender for Endpoint detects that there are drivers using these certificates, it will detect it as malware. It hasn't been revoked from the root store of Windows because like we said, it may cause other issues like valid NVIDIA drivers um, getting blocked. The other thing too, uh, to note for Windows is if you're using Secure Boot, normally this would protect against drivers that are past a certain date, but the exception was made for certificates that were created before July 29, 2015, and both of the certs were created before that date. So unfortunately in this case, Secure Boot isn't gonna protect against those. You could also create a Windows Defender application control policy, which we did talk about in one of our previous episodes where you could create a rule to deny or ally certain uh, specific versions of NVIDIA drivers. That may be difficult for folks who aren't familiar with Defender application control and for some IT admins. But in this case, I think the easiest way to do it is to rely on your EDR. As I said, most EDR and endpoint protection engines have already updated that if any executables are signed with these particular certificates, they will automatically detect as malware. And if you have them on your system already, it may just detect it because it could be a valid driver that has been signed with that certificate. So you can check for that with your EDR and, and then with uh, specific IOCs and, and look for those. Anything you want to add, Adam? <laughs> okay. Pretty, pretty straightforward there. You know, I do appreciate, and I think our audience will too, kind of walking through some of the details of it there, because it does get a little fuzzy on the surface of, okay, we've got certificates, we have signed drivers, what is being done automatically and what action do I need to take? I I'd kind of heard about this, but I didn't know all the details myself. So I'm sure I'm in the same boat as our listeners in that just kind of walking through all of those, those little details and, and then also kind of explaining why some of the heavier, you know, more nuclear options haven't been employed. It's because they could have negative impact on production systems. And, and that's always something to avoid too. So it sounds like pretty straightforward that, the serial numbers of the certs are, are widely known and, and those are easily read. They're in the plain text part of the certificate. And so any defensive engine worth its salt should be able to detect those and prevent them from being used. Okay, so let's talk about Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And as avid listeners of the podcast know, Adam and I work for Microsoft, so we have certain things that we can and cannot say. Um, we have specific guidance and we'll talk through the public blog as well as some of the guidance that we give our customers. And there are some things that we just either don't know or can't say um, specific to the attack because it is an ongoing investigation. So with that aside on March 22nd of this year, Microsoft confirmed that one of 
our employees um, was compromised by the Lapsus group. 37 gigs of source code data was stolen from a Microsoft Azure DevOps server. And Lapsus confirmed that theft with the publication of some screenshots shared on their Telegram channel. We published a blog on Dev0537, which is Lapsus. It's the group that's given to them as far as threat intelligence goes. And in the blog, it's really, really good if you're really interested about the threat intelligence that our security group has gathered on them as far as how they gain their initial access, how they escalate privileges within an organization, exfiltration techniques, everything that they have on this group as far as threat intel, this blog will kind of go through it. And they, they map it to the MITRE attack framework. And they also have some mitigations at the end. Most importantly, Microsoft has said that no customer code or data was involved in the activities. And in the investigation so far, they found a single account was compromised. It had limited access and the response teams were able to engage quickly to remediate the account. And then also Microsoft does not rely on the secrecy of code as a security measure and viewing source code does not lead to an elevation of risk. So in the mitigations and recommendations as far as what to do, there's a whole list of things. I'm just going to highlight a few and we have talked about some of this, but Um, It's always good to highlight MFA. Obviously, if you don't have MFA enabled, that's going to be the first thing to do uh, to mitigate against this type of attack because you're going to need that secondary authentication. Username and password is no good. We also say in the blog that you shouldn't use weak MFA uh, methods such as text messages, which are susceptible to SIM swapping which is what the Lapsus group has been known for is to gain access via a telecommunications provider and then swap the SIMs. Also any type of simple voice approvals, simple push. You can use the more complicated MFA with a number matching, which is available in like the Microsoft authenticator. And then, A secondary email address is also not a very strong MFA factor. Location-based exclusions for MFA. This is, again, something that I have talked about in a zero-trust framework where a lot of companies will use their IP addresses, egress IP addresses for their corporate networks as an exclusion to MFA. That is... Honestly, not a very good policy because if an attacker gains access to your network via a VPN, then you've already excluded them from the one thing that could deter them, which is MFA. So I would honestly recommend that you don't use any type of location-based exclusion. And then finally, with a lot of the cloud SaaS apps that are out there, A lot of times you have shared credentials. Don't share an MFA factor. That should be something that you don't do. Although I know it happens, ideally you would put controls around it and put it, say, in like a corporate one password or last pass where you can add the factor in there. That's a better way to do it, but still it's it's not great but I understand this, it happens. So try to mitigate that as much as possible. And then we also mentioned about requiring healthy and trusted endpoints. Whenever I talk about zero trust, I, I tell my customers or anyone that I'm talking to that you can have my Microsoft username and password. I could give that to you, but you're not going to be able to do anything with it because number one, you're going to need my MFA factor. And if somehow you were able to get that, you'd still have to have a trusted endpoint. So you'd have to enroll a device into Intune and have that be compliant in order for you to access anything on the Microsoft network. So trusted endpoints is that next step, right? To have compliance policies and MDM 
modern management in order to guard against this. So a couple of thoughts here. Number one, just kind of going over, you, you know, what you had already shared as far as uh, what Microsoft is saying publicly and, and what we can share, you know, uh, Andy wasn't being coy about like, Oh, what we can and can't share. Like we don't have, you know, a whole bunch of knowledge additional that we just can't talk about. It's, it's just, it's not shared with us. You know, we don't need to know it's a need to know basis and we don't need to know. So it's just more of, um, what has been shared publicly, but I, I will say the, um, you know, a lot of this is the system working as designed, right? As, as we talk about uh, with different circumstances like this, I've talked about in the past that while everybody's goal should be to to write secure code that never needs patched and never has uh, security exploits or issues, um, that's not reality. And so what you should really judge companies on are the quality of their bug bounty program, how quickly they respond to um, properly disclosed threats and patch them. And, and how smooth and seamless their patching process is, right? It's not about preventing that from happening, although that's a noble goal, but it's really about how you respond to that. And I think with security, this is where some of um, adjusting our mindset is really helpful in that obviously the goal is to never have an account compromised ever. But I'm sure almost every listener of the show knows that accounts have been compromised in their organization in the past and some data or documents have been uh, viewed or possibly even exfiltrated, right? And and that happens. What the real measure is, is, is reducing dwell time, how long they're in your uh, service, uh, how much they can have access to, you know, having that kind of blast radius set up so you can get to some things but not others. And then um, how quickly you're able to contain and eradicate the threat, you know? And, and that's really when you get into that kind of assume breach mindset that's what that looks like in reality is although we acknowledge that the goal is still to prevent that from ever happening today, the real measure is how quickly do we respond and eradicate that threat and limit how much damage they can do. So, you know, I will, again, you know, not, not really speaking on behalf of anyone, but I would say the goal, the goal is the gold standard, of course, but in the big scheme of things, uh, from Microsoft's perspective, as Andy talked about, taking source code um, is not a great thing by any means, but certainly doesn't represent a threat to our customers because the secrecy of the source code is, is not a security measure. It's not a security method. Just like open source projects, you can have an open source project um, that has the source code readily available. It can still be a secure solution, right? It's not that the inability to view the source code is not you know, dependent on uh, how secure the the resulting product is. And so that's kind of the scenario here where we actually plan for uh, that people would view our source code and and that's normal. And in fact, Microsoft does um, uh, have have scenarios in the past where I have acknowledged, you know, letting different um, countries, you know, national security efforts view source code and that sort of thing. So anyhow, this is all good stuff. I, I thought that post on the Microsoft security blog written by our, the Microsoft Threat Intelligence team, uh, or Mystic as they're called, is really, really good. And I posted that on LinkedIn, and I talked about, honestly, how terrifying it is. And and I'll kind of go back to this theme again. Lapsus is doing, again, not like super technically interesting things, not like super brilliant zero-day attacks that are really clever and novel it's more of they have found all this collection of weak points in how we think about and approach security, and they're exploiting them uh, in, in a lot of cases. And so talking about MFA methods and moving away from some of those weaker methods, you know, we talk to customers a lot and, and every now and then you run to customers who are like, don't have MFA deployed. And of course, that's awful. And then you run to customers who have MFA deployed, but it has to be super easy and they, you know, build it around this lowest common denominator mindset where they can't ever ask anybody to do anything as far as um, buying hardware for them or providing something to them like a YubiKey key or, or whatever the case may be. And so they do things like SMS codes and stuff like that, which any MFA is better than no MFA. However, now that hopefully most people have MFA deployed at their companies, now we're ready to take that next step and move to more secure MFA, MFA methods. And then, you know, requiring healthy and trusted endpoints. That's another one a lot where organizations be like, well, we're just not ready for that yet. And I get you have a lot of competing priorities. I do. 
And I know security teams are always hunting the new shiny object of the world, whatever, you know, the latest buzzword is that's in all the security publications, you know, XDR, whatever it is today. Remember when it was Casby a couple of years ago, but, and, and we, we hammer on this all the time on this show, but it's doing the little things. It's moving on from insecure MFA methodologies to more secure phishing resistant MFA methods. It is zero trust mindset and network architecture that doesn't implicitly trust anything. I still have a really hard time when I talk to a customer and they'll be like, yeah, well, we, you know, we trust any, if you're coming from our network, we don't prompt you for MFA. Please stop doing that prompt for MFA. Well, we get prompted too much. Well, then you're doing something else wrong. And you know, that's another discussion for another time. But by the way, if you are doing any of these MFA exclusions, because your perception is you get prompted for MFA too much, then your MFA implementation is wrong or your vendor does it bad or whatever. Um, you know, our theory at Microsoft on MFA, and I, I love this and approve of this very strongly, is that it should be once per user, per device, per password reset. So if your password expiration interval is 90 days, your user, if they're on that same device and nothing is materially changed with that user, should only get prompted for MFA once on that device. Like that's that's our kind of North Star on that. And so if you're, if you're prompting more than that, um, I think there's a discussion to be had that you are, you are actually delivering worse security, uh, prompting users for MFA too often is bad as well. So that's a whole other discussion for another time, but go and read this, this criminal actor targeting organizations blog on, on the mystic blog about dev zero five, three, seven or, or lapsus as we're talking about today, phenomenal stuff. And if this isn't an impetus to stand up like an insider risk program to really get serious about MFA, to get serious about zero trust, I don't know what will be um, because they've taken down some big, big companies uh, with, with some pretty sophisticated security. Again, you know, I, I am biased, but I think Microsoft did a really good job of containing and eradicating this threat quickly um, and, and being very open about <laughs> what was going on. Um, but we'll talk about some, um, some other experiences in a minute, but anyhow, uh, really good, really interesting stuff here. And, and, um, I guess let's move on to the next, uh, target of lapses, Andy. Yeah. I had a quick thought too. I recently moderated a cybersecurity panel. And on that panel, we talked about strategic partnerships that cybersecurity teams should have within an organization. And I had mentioned that two of them that I commonly see are, the legal department and finance, mainly because legal number one deals with um, privacy and laws as well as um, contracts. So at my, one of my organizations that I worked at um, any contract for purchase of new hardware or uh, software had to go and get approval. Number one, obviously with a contract through legal, but then had to go through finance to get funding approved and then security had to approve it and make sure that it was vetted. I think with Lapsus, another strategic partnership, which is kind of a wake up call is HR. And with the great resignation and people being generally unhappy with their jobs and leaving in droves. And I think this shines a light onto employees that may be disgruntled or managers who are not very good managers, companies who have bad HR practices. You know, they should take a hard look at their um, merit increases and benefits and all of that because these are the reasons why people are taking money from lapses. I mean, if they offered someone who was disgruntled a hundred thousand dollars for access into their corporation, there are going to be people who are going to take that. And so, I think. Security teams should start partnering with HR and get that type of information and intel from them. And HR departments for sure should stop. Um, you know, if you have a bad practice and you're allowing bad managers to continue or just funneling them around, or you haven't really looked at your compensation in a while, like this is a security risk. I mean, I can confidently say that this is a security risk that security teams need to start being aware of and need to actively try to engage on with their HR departments. You know, on that note, insider risk management tools 
can tie into HR systems and use some of those signals as an impetus for kicking off an investigation that an employee has received, you know, um, possibly like a performance improvement plan or something. And, and those can kick those off. So that's, that's a really interesting call out, but it just shows you the breadth and depth of security today is beyond just tooling. There's a human factor. And, and I, that's kind of a recurring theme here as we talk through today. So that's a super great call out. And again, not meant to be like scary, but kind of should be to some of our listeners in that this is an area where I'm sure you have lacking a lot of comfort in for many people. And it's time to start having those conversations. When you, when you get security clearance for the military, you, you know, they look at all sorts of things. And Andy, you probably know this way better than me, although I, I, I was a person interviewed for uh, a reference for somebody achieving clearance. And, you know, they ask you questions about like, do they owe debts, you know, to foreign governments or, or powerful people that could potentially compromise them because they need money and they will make bad choices. This is no different than that. As you are evaluating the security of your people and your organization, you put a great deal of trust in them. And so you need to have an awareness of their overall um, well-being, you know, end to end, mentally, financially, et cetera. And so I, I want to pivot here for a second before we move on to our next thing. I, I, I wanted to kind of give a little, not so much a disclaimer, but just kind of talk about this. So Andy and I would just spend a big segment talking about our employer, Microsoft, and, and had been the uh, one of the uh, folks who had been uh, on the receiving end of, of a lapsus uh, security incident. And so the next company we're going to talk about is Okta. Now, Okta is, of course, a, a very great identity platform and is a competitor to Microsoft in many ways. Now, I have been at Microsoft five years in technical sales and, and in solution sales, and, and Andy has for you know several years now as well. And, and a principle we both share in our job is that those in glass houses should not throw stones. We don't believe in that. Because in technology, what goes around comes around. So if if AWS or GCP has an outage, you're not going to see me pounding my chest on it about LinkedIn and telling people to move to Azure. I don't do that. Because the, the soon as I do that, <laughs> then Azure is going to have you know an outage the next day or something. And if a competitor has a security incident, you don't go around pounding your chest because next thing you know, Microsoft's going to be on the receiving end of it or whatever. It, it's just what goes around comes around in our industry. And I talk about how we need to recalibrate our expectations. And I just did that whole soapbox speech, so I won't give it again. But the fact is downtime happens, security incidents happen, and not all code is 100% secure. And so if your expectation is we will never get breached, we will never go down, and all of our applications must be 100% secure, then your your expectations are out of line with reality. And, and so as we talk through Okta being compromised here by Lapsus and what happened with them, uh, this is not in a gleeful throwing stones kind of look. This is a how can we as security professionals learn from what happened and do things better the next time? And how can other vendors like Okta and like our employer handle it better in terms of customer communication and making sure that we are as transparent as possible while also allowing investigations to proceed. So I just want to really call that out there. Much like if you take a world religions class in college, you know, that's not your university endorsing a specific religion. It's the academic study of religion this is the academic study of a compromise of a company that just happens to compete with our employer, right? And so I just want to really kind of set the stage there that I think this is a really important conversation to have. This was top of mind for a lot of security professionals this week, but I want to talk about that we're looking through this as an academic lens and as a learning opportunity for all of us vendors and customers and security professionals alike. So with that, Let's get into it, Andy. Okay. So on the same day, Lapsus announced that they had compromised Okta as well. It was March 22nd. And they published screenshots of Okta's internal tenant uh, on their Telegram channel. And then later on, Okta admitted that 
they had roughly 366 or two and a half percent of their customer base that were affected by this breach. So they confirmed the breach in a blog post and then they confirmed later how many people were actually breached. And so how Lapsus got access was through a third party provider that was doing work for Octa, so a contractor. And so the laptop of a third party provider named Cytel was compromised for approximately five days beginning in January of this year, January 19th to be specific. Okta learned about that breach roughly five days after and hired Mandiant to participate as part of the incident response and do some forensics and figure out what happened. Mandiant published their findings in a report which was obtained by a security researcher named Bill Dermacopy who tweeted about it and subsequently was actually terminated by his employer uh, because he refused to take down the tweets, which was it's another story, interesting, but we learned a lot from his tweets and then he shared it with TechCrunch and TechCrunch published an article on it as well. And so we're just going to walk through that. So the initial compromise was actually using a CVE and Lapsus used mostly off-the-shelf tooling like Process Explorer and Process Hacker. Once they got access to this person's laptop, they were able to bypass the FireEye endpoint agent simply by terminating it, which is really interesting that they can terminate an endpoint agent process. So they just terminated it and there was no endpoint protection on the device and they basically had free reign. Once they were able to crawl around, they found an Excel document titled Dom admins dash lastpass dot XLSX, which is an Excel spreadsheet. So I had this conversation with some of my colleagues in the security um, specialist channel uh, in teams this morning about password managers. And someone made the comment that they don't like password managers because it basically uh, puts all your eggs in one basket and, and all that stuff. But I, for me, I think, again, security is about risk and the risk of not having a password manager in a world where we still have passwords is greater than, you know, having a password manager. So in a world where you're still using passwords, it's always still going to be more secure to have a password manager with long, complicated passwords that you don't remember. Um, I, I totally well, however, agree, by the way, on, on password managers. And Andy, I like how you phrase that there, that there isn't a zero risk option. So you are picking the least risk. This is a concept people struggle with sometimes. And we actually see a lot of this, I think, right now around some of the, and I'm not wading into these waters, but some of these more ferocious debates ab about medical decisions. Um, and I'll just kind of leave it at that vague description. But people have this perception that doing nothing has zero risk versus doing something, you know, might carry some incremental, you know, small amount of risk. So by doing nothing, I am picking the less risky option. But what they're failing to do is accurately assess the risk of, of the status quo, right? And, and usually in medicine, you are not choosing between the zero risk option because that doesn't exist. You're choosing between the least risky option you know, that has the best outcomes, not perfect outcomes. And, and this is the same thing with that. Absolutely. Is there a risk inherent with password managers uh, that if they're compromised, now you have access to a whole ton of stuff? Sure. That same risk is present if you reuse your password at all your sites too, by the way. <laughs> If you if you like to reuse your password, which most people do if they're not using a password manager, because otherwise you're a cyborg that can memorize complex different passwords for every single site you use. Um, so I mean that's that's kind of the incremental risk there. So I'm a big fan of password managers too, but definitely understand that this is an extremely attractive target and harden it with every option available to you. You know, I, I personally uh, use one password. Of course, I have a very long, complex one password to get into my vault. And then I also take advantage of their two FA option for it. And I actually do mine with a physical YubiKey. 
uh, to protect that, which I think is phenomenal and, and feel really confident in that ability. So unless you have both, you know, what's in here, which is like super duper long, like 40 characters, plus you have my YubiKey, you're not getting in my password vault. So anyhow, uh, just wanted to agree with you there. Uh, exporting them to Excel, not so great though. Right. Don't export your passwords to an Excel spreadsheet. I understand you can do that with different password managers to migrate to a different password manager. However, don't keep them. <laughs> Nuke them after you you've transferred the, the data. So that's how they got access to the passwords. And then what they did was create a malicious email transport rule forwarding all of the emails within Cytel's environment to their own accounts. This is something you can create a rule for, for your admins to notify. In fact, at my previous organization, we blocked uh, just flat out forwarding of all emails to an external email address because even employees will do this. They'll forward their corporate email to their personal Gmail. We had someone who went on leave and just forwarded all their email to their Gmail address. And so you should block that. And then it doesn't prevent people from just forwarding a single email. It's just auto forwarding. And anytime anyone created something like an admin and ex exchange admins would still have the ability to do this and create a transport rule, the security folks would get notified. And then I can say, Hey, you know, I saw you create this rule. Like, you know, why are you doing that? And so that's what they did. And then once they were able to see all the data and getting all the Intel on it, they created a new site user account and added it to the tenant administration uh, security group, which is the domain admin uh, or the global admins, I should say. And then Cytel found them in the network. 14 hours later, they issued a company-wide password reset to try to lock them out. Now, Okta has faced a lot of criticism for knowing about the attack for two months and not disclosing it until Lapsus basically said, hey, look at what we did on their Telegram channel. And fortuitously, or I guess timely we talked about disclosure of cybersecurity events last week the sec has a proposal okta is a publicly traded entity and so you know the sec rule to disclose cybersecurity incidents uh, would affect them not yet but it would affect them in the future and then of course congress has also enacted that cybersecurity incident reporting act and so the conversation really has shifted from when should we disclose to now why wasn't it given at the time that you found out about it. And there's a blog that was written by the Tenable CEO on LinkedIn. It was an open letter to Okta, which is an interesting read, but I'll just read part of it here because Okta's blog talked about how they were compromised. But in the open letter, the CEO of Tenable Amit Yoren said, no indicators of compromise have been published, no best practices, no guidance has been released on how to mitigate any potential risk. As a customer, all we can say is that Okta has not contacted us and to the best of our knowledge, we are not affected by the breach. Out of an abundance of caution, we are taking what we believe to be logical actions to minimize exposure. And that's basically what I've heard from a lot of Okta customers is that if they haven't been contacted by Okta, they assume that they're not affected, but they're basically on their own to investigate and implement what they think are mitigation actions. So like Adam said, this is not really to point out that, you know, Okta's not a great company or anything like that. We're not trying to dunk on them. It is strictly just looking at what they did and reacting to how they disclose the breach security isn't perfect but how you respond builds trust and trust is built on transparency and during the solar uh, solar gate incident even mandiant and fireeye they were breached too but if you go back and look at how fireeye disclosed how they were breached i mean they were giving basically a play-by-play on what happened, who was affected, how they got rid of it, all the things that they found and they published it all. And, you know, that was a lesson to the security industry and vendors and companies in general on how to really 
provide trust and continue on because everyone's going to get breached at some point. Like there's no one who's perfect, but how you react to it really signifies, you know, the maturity of your organization and, you know, how that builds trust within the organ, you know, the community in general. FireEye is widely credited with really being the first to disclose the SolarGate compromises coming out of SolarWinds and, uh, they were widely praised in the security community for how well I handled it. And Andy and I work with a lot of security decision makers, and I don't re- ever recall one saying at the time or now, well, oh boy, we're going to drop fire eye, you know, because of this, they earned so much goodwill and so much respect for the way they handled it. I think it only improved their positioning in the industry and, and people's willingness to, bet their own careers on a company like FireEye. That, that's somebody you want to do business with, right? And so I think, obviously, the the timeliness, the forthrightness of the disclosure needs to be improved. I think also taking ownership of any vendors you work with or contractors or anybody else that's part of your organization, internally or externally, you need to treat them like they're part of your company. This is a lesson Apple kind of learned the hard way about 10, 12 years ago when a lot of the uh, attention started getting on working conditions at Foxconn and how that reflected on Apple and, and the working conditions of the people who, who build these millions of iPhones every single year. And I think at first, Apple tried to take this tact of disassociating themselves from Foxconn and saying, well, that's Foxconn. That's not our problem. But it of course was right. And, and I think today while no means perfect, the reason we hear less about that, I hope is not because we, we accept it. And, and my hope, my, you know, I'm going to be really optimist here is that Apple has used their powers of persuasion to improve working conditions there and to enforce and and demand um, better working conditions for their, um, for the people that make their phones, you know, and, and hopefully that's the case. And that's why we've heard not as much recently. Um, But what, what they began to understand is that reflects on them. And, and that's why they started making those um, mandates and started to enforcing those kinds of working conditions. And so, but while no means perfect and, and certainly not to the standard of, of Western working conditions, and there's still work to do, I'm not saying like problem solved or anything. I think Apple at least deserves credit for understanding that vendors and their supply chain reflect on them. And so I was very disappointed when some of these uh, communications first came out that they were, they were much more kind of like, well, that's Cytel's fault. It's not ours. And I'm like, well, if Cytel is, you know, somebody that you rely on to deliver your service, then you need to make sure they live up to your standards of security and service delivery and everything else. And you need to take ownership of that. If you had not audited them enough or did not have enough awareness of what was going on there, that reflects on you. And so I think that's a lesson learned for, for anybody listening is as you have people in your you know, quote unquote, supply chain for delivering security in your organization. Like if you have an MSSP or something like that, you have a managed SOC, you still ultimately have responsibility for that. And if they're not delivering, it's going to come back on you. So make sure that you have line of sight, you have visibility into what they're doing. Those are, those are lessons we can all learn. And and as you talk to your vendors, um, you know, make sure that, that they're taking responsibility for it as well. So I think that was something to me that really stood out and I was disappointed in, and I thought there's room for improvement. And Andy, I think you obviously touched on just, you know, the, the transparency of disclosure and the openness of disclosure. We get certainly on this show that you can't always say everything right away as your investigation is ongoing. Sometimes you just don't know yet. You can't definitively say, like this wasn't accessed or this didn't happen. But the worst thing you can do is say definitively something was this way and then discover it, it actually wasn't. You have to walk it back because that does not engender trust either. I'd rather you were vague and then clarified as details came to light than made a blanket statement one way and then had to retract it and walk it back later. You know, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. And, and then um, finally, 
as we talked about, or I talked about, you know, fire, fire, I getting such a positive viewpoint in the security industry. And, and I personally take a lot of pride in the blog post we talked about in the Microsoft section that Microsoft had put out on dev zero five, eight, seven or, or lapses as we're calling them, you know, that walk through all of their, uh, tactics and techniques and procedures and, and how they actually conducted their business. There's a ton of intelligence in there, a ton of actionable things you can learn from and change in your environment to better protect against lapses. So Microsoft certainly took that to heart of how can we help the broader community and help all of our customers and even our non-customers harden their own environments to protect against them. That's what we need to see more of is, is companies using their massive resources for good to help secure others and taking their lessons learned and sharing them broadly and publicly. And so for the tenable um, leader, CEO, I guess it was, to say, we haven't gotten any IOCs, we haven't had any best practices, there's been no guidance coming out of it. I think that's disappointing as well, because I'm sure there's lots of companies, and I, and I have talked to some of them, that are like, we're on Okta, we weren't notified that we were breached, but um, you know, what do we do now? What should we look at? What would be what are, what are we looking for in case you missed it? Um, if we're doing an audit of everything connected to it. And if you're a company that has, you know, hundreds of applications connected, any single one of those applications, if you can compromise the overall identity platform, then you can get administrative access to those downstream systems potentially. And so that's a lot, a lot of attack surface to look at and to try to sift through. Now, hopefully um, on a totally unrelated note, you're actually not using uh, federated identities as privileged accounts and other cloud services, because that's a great way to cut off lateral movement. Uh, but that's another conversation for another time. So anyhow, this is definitely something we can learn from and grow from and, and certainly hope, like we talked about last week, that a lot of these uh, SEC requirements for publicly traded companies or congressional requirements do result in more timely and more transparent notifications to customers on what's happening with a lot of these co companies where we entrust a great deal of data to. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.